If you've got your Bible with you, I'm going to read a verse from Ephesians and chapter 6. And we always begin this part of the service by reading from the scriptures because this is the only source that we can authoritatively trust as being the mind and will of God for us. This book, written by human people, was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it deals with timeless truths that first written in a context very different to ours, but which has its relevance and its truth in our day to day. And if you've been here over recent weeks, you'll know that we've been looking into Ephesians chapter 6 at a section where Paul talks about the armor as he describes it, that a Christian is to wear. Because make absolutely no mistake about this at all, we are in a battle. It is a real battle. And the battle is not against material things, though they may have their role in the battle, but actually behind all of those, there are principalities and powers and authorities and spiritual forces of evil is how he describes them in verse 12. And we are to wear the armor that equips us to be defended against these attacks and at the same time to enable us to move forward in the purposes of God. And the verse I'm going to read and talk about is in verse 16 where he says, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. This is the fourth piece of armor that Paul talks about. He talked about the belt of truth buckled around your waist. We talked about that a few weeks ago. The breastplate of righteousness. He talks about feet fitted with readiness, being available and mobile for where God wants to place us. And now he talks about the shield of faith. Make no mistake that we will be attacked by the devil continuously, at any opportunity, at any time, in any way. There's no relief from this. We are in our most dangerous position when we think we might be free from this, because often it is subtle. There are many examples of satanic attacks in the Bible. There are general references to this, but very specific ones like temptation. You remember Jesus in the wilderness was tempted Specifically, so will you, so am I. There is personal attack that he brings against the people of God. Paul writes about a thorn in his flesh that he describes as a messenger of Satan to torment me. And there'll be things that will come to torment you, attacks upon us personally. There'll be the accusations made against us, as in the story of Job, when the devil talks about Job to God and totally undermines Job's motivation in what he does and accuses him. You have an instance in the book of Zechariah, a man called Joshua is standing condemned by Satan. And he will bring condemnation against you and against me as well. And then, of course, he is the father of lies. He is called that by Jesus. And you find him lying to Eve and deceiving her in that way. And he will lie to you and his lies will be plausible. No one believes big, black, hairy lies that you recognize through. Oh, that's a lie. It's the subtle deceit that has an element of truth in it that seduces us and pulls us in. None of us are exempt, and what we need is to understand what the shield of faith is. Now, we tend to think of shield as a piece of material you hold in front of you to stop the arrows hitting you or the bullets, whatever it might be. But there's a bigger picture than simply that. About three weeks ago, I was in Colombia with some folks from Living Truth, and some of the time we were there, we traveled in a bulletproof vehicle. We didn't actually need it, 
but there are a number of bulletproof vehicles and armored vehicles left over from more dangerous days in Colombia. And we're in Bogota, and we were driven in this bulletproof vehicle for some of the time. And it was fascinating. The doors were very heavy and all kinds of ways in which they automatically lock and so on. But the windows are made up of several layers of glass and a polycarbonate material that are uh, stuck together, bonded together, and a bullet can pierce the outer piece of glass, but when it hits the polycarbonate layer, it absorbs the energy of the bullet and spreads it across the window, and actually it, it even reflects it back in the opposite direction. There's several layers, so it, uh, it is designed to be completely bulletproof. Um, we almost hope somebody would shoot us to see how it worked. <laughs> I think there are nine levels of armored vehicles. We were number four, or number five, I can't remember exactly one of those. Uh, number nine, I guess, is bomb-proof. <laughs> but the idea of a bulletproof vehicle, an armored vehicle, is that you have a hiding place in it that is a refuge. And in the scripture, it often speaks of a shield and a refuge being the same thing. You Not know, just a shield you hold up, but a refuge, a place to hide. In the Psalms, Psalm 18 and verse 30, it says of God, he is a shield for those who take refuge in him. Psalm 119, verse 114, you are my refuge and my shield. I put my hope in you. In Psalm 18, the psalmist says, God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield. There are three images there, rock, refuge, and shield. And these things come together. God is my rock. God is my refuge. God is my shield. In other words, God is the bulletproof hiding place in which, though under attack, and we will be, I find a security and a safety, though we need to qualify what that safety is, as I will do so in just a moment. And the Psalms in particular are full of this idea of the Lord being our shield. Psalm 3, you are a shield around me. Psalm 710, my shield is God most high. Psalm 33, 20, we wait in hope for the Lord. He's our help and our shield. Psalm 84, the Lord God is a sun and shield. And there are other references. And there are examples in other parts of Scripture too. God said to Abraham, I am your shield and your very great reward. Abraham, I'm giving you a commission. I am your shield. I'm the one who's going to surround you and provide a refuge in which you can hide. That doesn't mean you're going to have an easy ride, but it means you're going to have a refuge, a shelter within the difficult journey that you may be on. I want to talk about this in two ways this morning. I want to talk about the shield as a refuge, first of all, a hiding place. And I want to talk about the fact he speaks of the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So it's a shield of faith. And what does that mean? Let me talk first then about the shield as a refuge. A shield never stops an attack, of course. That's not its purpose. A shield is designed to protect you in the attack. We may be tempted to hope that maybe lifting up a shield of faith, whatever we think that to be, is somehow going to prevent attacks on us. But that is not what the scripture tells us. A lot of our praying is about that. We pray, oh God, stop this problem, take it away, solve this issue, heal this disease. That's the way we pray. God, just fix it. You don't need a shield for that. The shield is when you live within the sphere of attack. One of the best examples of this in the Bible is probably in the story of Job. Many of you will know the story. Job came under heavy attack from Satan. 
And we have some remarkable insight into that story in Job chapter 1 and 2, where we have an event that takes place behind the scenes in heaven, where God brought his angels before him, and amongst them was Satan. A few weeks ago, when we talked about these principalities and powers and authorities and spiritual forces of evil that are there in verse 12 of Ephesians 6, we talked about this. And this intriguing picture of Satan, though once the most beautiful of all God's angels being cast out of heaven to earth, is every once in a while hauled back up into heaven and virtually sat down in front of God and God said, how are you getting on? And Satan said, I'm going to and fro throughout the whole earth, causing as much trouble as I can. And God said to him in Job 1 and verse 8, I'll read it to you. He said, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So says God, all right, you're causing mischief. How are you getting on with Job? And God's description of Job is a very important one. He says there is nobody on earth like this man. This is the best man I have got. Blameless, upright, fears God, shuns evil. And Satan's response was this. Does Job fear God for nothing? <laughs> you think Job trusts you and is blameless because that's the way he is? Don't you realize you've made life good for Job? He doesn't fear you for nothing. He goes on to say, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will curse you to your face. So says Satan, hey, of course Job worships you, of course Job trusts you, of course Job loves you. Life's good for Job. You built a hedge around him, you protected him, but take away the hedge and he'll curse you to your face. So God said, all right, then we'll take down the hedge. Very well then, the Lord said to Satan, Everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. In other words, touch wherever you like, but don't touch his body. Well, Job didn't know, of course, that this conversation was going on. The first thing Job knew was when a servant came running in and said, Job, your ox and your donkeys had been stolen by some Sabians and they killed all your servants. Only I escaped to come and tell you. And while Job was getting over that information, somebody came running and said, Job, your sheep were out grazing when a lightning bolt hit the field, burst into flames, burned up all your sheep and your servants. Only I escaped to tell you. Somebody else came running and said, Job, your camels have all been stolen. The Chaldeans made some raiding parties. They killed your servants. I escaped to tell you. And while he was getting over that, the worst news of all came. Somebody came and said, Job, your sons and your daughters, there were nine of them, were in the house, the eldest son's house, having a party when a hurricane came in from the desert, hit the house, it fell flat, all your children are dead. And it says, in verse 21 of this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground in worship. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I'll depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. So here's Job. Everything in his life has fallen apart, and his response is he fell to the ground in worship. You know, there's nothing impressive about praising God for the good things in life. That's that's being polite. But here, in the bad, tragic things, Job worships. That's true worship. In chapter 2, the scene goes back to heaven again. Satan's there again. How are you getting on? Going to and fro? Yeah, what about my servant Job? But when you told me I shouldn't touch his body, you knew he was so selfish, even though he loses all his possessions, as long as there's no physical pain in his own body, even though he loses his own kids, as long as there's no pain physically, he's okay. God said, all right, then you can touch his body. Don't take his life. By the way, there are a couple of things we need to just know by observation there. 
One is Satan needs permission to attack us. Second thing we need to know is that when he asks for it, God gives it. And God does give permission to attack. He said to Simon Peter one day, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And I'm praying for you that your faith will not fail. In other words, Simon, Satan has asked permission to attack you and permission has been granted. I'm praying for you. And you know how the Peter fell apart in the next couple of days. Job then was afflicted physically from the top of his head to the soles of his feet with sores. He sat in the ash heap, which at least was sterile, and scratched himself with broken pottery. And then his wife turned against him because in chapter 2 and verse 9, his wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Mrs. Job is a very interesting case. She experienced all the loss that Job experienced. His children were her children, of course. His loss of business is her loss of income. But the interesting thing is that in the same situation, under the same pressure, Job worshipped, Mrs. Job cursed. You know, very often, it's when we're in trouble that the real us comes to the surface. You see, all of us can be fair weather Christians. As long as the sun is shining and the sky is blue and the grass is green, we worship God. But when things go wrong, when we find ourselves in trouble, that's when the real me surfaces. And in Job's case, he was genuinely, authentically a man who trusted God. He responded in worship. Mrs. Job responded in saying, curse God. And then die, she said to him. Let him finish you off. You see, when we're in trouble, sometimes when we're in trouble, we turn into ourselves and begin to lick our sores and we begin to become self-pitying and then we become angry and then we start to get cross with everything around us and then we become bitter. But when you turn to God, as Job did, you're still in the storm, but there's a tranquility of heart. That doesn't mean that everything then starts to get better. For Job, it started to get worse. In chapter 3, he went into deep depression. So deep, he became suicidal. He begins chapter 3 by saying, it says, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And he spends half a chapter talking about the fact that the worst day in history was the day his father was given the news, congratulations, you have a son. I wish that day could be written out of history, he says. And then he had three friends who came to see him, and the best thing they did was to sit down and say nothing for seven days. That was the best thing they did. And then they opened their mouths and spoiled it and began to offer their advice. Eliphaz the Tenemite was one, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Nermethite, their talk joined later by a fourth guy called Elihu. And their reasoning was basically this, Job, there must be something wrong in your life. You must be deserving of this. They used an expression, you reap what you sow. It was Eliphaz who said that. So Job, what's been going on in your life? And Job said, I don't know what's wrong. Job, think harder. That's a lie. What kind of secret things have been going on in your life nobody else knows about? I don't know anything going on like that. Job, what were your sons and daughters doing in the house the day that it fell and they were killed? Job, what was going on there, huh? Do you know? Who else was with them, Job? What do they have in the house? you any idea, Job? Why were they judged this way, Job? And they heaped this kind of condemnation on him. In fact, these friends talked for 35 chapters, which is a long time to talk. 
And at the end of it, God said to him, what you have said is not good. It's 35 chapters of nonsense. But it's very logical nonsense. It says, every effect has a cause. Bad things are the effect. There must be bad causes. Job, something's wrong in your life. Actually, the truth is, it was the complete reverse, because God said about him, remember, there's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Job is the subject of satanic attack, not because things were wrong, but because he was the best man on earth. It was his goodness that was the reason for his attack. And Job had to rely on something. And what he had to rely on was this. Although I haven't any idea what is going on, I do know this. God is doing something in this. Because in chapter 23, he said this in verse 8. Job said, if I go to the east, he, God, is not there. If I go to the west, I don't find him. When he's at work in the north, I don't see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. In other words, east, west, north, south, I don't know where God is in all of this. If you ask me to give you my testimony, I have no clue what God is doing. But, he says, although I don't know where God is, but he knows the way that I take when he has tested me, I'll come forth as gold. I don't know where God is, he says, but God knows where I am. And that is my security. And when he has tested me, I'll come forth as gold, not as garbage or chewed up and spat out. I'll come forth as gold because the refining process of gold is a process whereby you heat a thing up and you, you put it under pressure. Job's looking beyond the immediate circumstances to say, I have a refuge, and although I don't enjoy it, and although I'm depressed internally, as well as oppressed externally, I have this certainty, though I cannot see where God is, he knows where I am, and when he's finished, he will have made gold. That is true for you, and it's true for me. When we learn what it is to take this shield as a refuge, that God is our shield and our refuge, that though we come under all kinds of attack, we are sheltered and safe in the midst of it because God is doing something through this. And in this. And Job went on to say, and this is important too, my feet have followed his steps. I've kept to his way without turning aside. I've not departed from the commands of his lips. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Job said, in the midst of all this, I'll tell you where I have gone. I have treasured his word. He didn't have the full scriptures that we have. In the midst of the attack, in the midst of the uncertainties, we treasure the words of his mouth. We don't depart from the commands of his lips. We keep to his way. We closely follow his steps. You know, it's not just sit back, yeah, everything's going to work out for well. No, we stick close to God and we find in him a refuge so that he knows the way that I take. You know, learning to fall backwards, as we saw a few minutes ago, that's okay. After a while, once you've experienced, yeah, I can fall backwards. Someone's there to catch me. But when you don't know where God is, and he says, just let yourself go and trust me. It's hard, isn't it? Job, in the midst of the storm around his life, says, I don't know where God is, but he knows where I am. 
When he's tried me, I'll come forth as gold. Corrie ten Boom used to say, God doesn't have any problems, he only has plans. Well, to us, our problems, to God, our plans. She likens looking at a tapestry, you see a beautiful picture, but you go behind the tapestry, you see all kinds of interweaning strands that don't make sense. We look from the underside, it doesn't make sense, but there's a picture that's being produced. Those of you who follow world news will be aware that later this week, southern Sudan will become the newest country in the world, independent of what is now northern Sudan, totally separate country. Northern Sudan is predominantly Muslim and will be, in all likelihood, completely Muslim, governed by Sharia law, shortly. Southern Sudan is predominantly Christian. And in a referendum earlier this year, by a huge majority of something like 98%, they asked for a separate nation. Some time ago, I was in southern Sudan to speak at a conference of pastors and ministers, some of whom had traveled four days to get there, on bicycle or on foot, crossing swollen rivers and all kinds of other obstacles. The man who led that conference was a man called Bishop Henry. And he had spent four years in prison in Khartoum having been released only a matter of months before we were there. When he was imprisoned, he was put into the political prison where they kept people from opposition parties and that kind of thing, and he was deemed to fit into that category because he insisted on preaching the gospel when he was forbidden to do so. And he found the folks in the political prison very difficult to really get through to, and so he asked to be removed to the criminal prison. And they said to him, why in the world would you want to go to the criminal prison? If you think this is bad, it is ten times worse there. He said, I want to go there because I want to preach the gospel, he said, and I think they'll be more responsive. They said, if you go to the criminal prison, you will never come back. If that's your choice, you will stay there for the rest of your sentence. Well, he went to the criminal prison, and uh, he said, uh, I planned a service and announced a service. He was an Anglican bishop. I guess that's what Anglicans do. They have services. So he planned a service. And um, five people came. Within a short time, there were 10 people coming. Several of them became Christians. The number grew to 100, and then to 200, and then to 250, many of whom became Christians. He told them, when a person became a Christian, I want to tell you two things. Number one, now that you're a Christian, you have eternal life. That is, you now have a relationship with Jesus Christ as living that extends beyond this life. But the second thing you need to know is that you will suffer. Many of the converts were beaten up in the prison. He himself was beaten up. In fact, when we were with him, he looked as though he was a boxer who had had a match a couple of days before, and part of his face was swollen and slightly disfigured. It was a result of his beatings in prison. When he left the prison after four years, he said 400 prisoners lined up to shake his hand as he left at the end of his sentence. You can't destroy a man like that because he has a refuge in the midst of the difficulty and the midst of the storm. He has his bulletproof vehicle, so to speak, though he does come under attack, but his heart is protected. He knew God to be his refuge. 
So that's the first thing. The shield is a place of refuge, a place to hide in the midst of the storm. The second thing is, he speaks in particular of the shield being the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You need to understand what he means by the shield of faith. The exercise of faith is the shield, is what he is saying there. And we are to live as those who exercise faith, and that becomes our shield and our protection hiding place. What do we mean by that? Many of you know that Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament is the sort of classic chapter on faith where there are many examples of men and women who live by faith. And it begins this way, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, don't take that verse out of context and come to the idea that, that faith itself is sort of hoping for something, trying to create within your own mind a certainty about it, and then it'll come to pass. Now, there are folks who hold that view, that if you hope for something and you really, really believe it, that brings it to pass. Christian science holds that understanding, where everything is spiritual and nothing is physical, that's an illusion, and so you pray and believe yourself out of problems by saying they're just illusions anyway, and believing and affirming something into being that is more spiritual. And uh, that is the basis of, of that belief. Uh, there was a book recently, a couple of years ago, called The Secret that sold millions of copies. And it teaches that we create our own lives by our thoughts, our envisaging, and our believing. If you really, really believe something, you'll bring it to pass. And, and tragically, I hear some folks who claim to be Christian preachers who will give you that impression too. As long as you really, really believe it, you'll bring it into being. That isn't the meaning of this. The meaning of this is that faith looks beyond the physical and the material to God with the certainty that though God is not material and physical, we don't see him in that way that he is more certain to us than the physical and the material. Because in the following verses in Hebrews 11, he gives examples of people who live by faith. And you can read them, and they're great men and women. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab. And then in verse 32, I'm going to read to you what he says there. He says, and what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. And you read that, you say, that is fantastic, that is wonderful stuff, that is dramatic, that is miraculous. But... He doesn't finish what he's writing there. He says, others were tortured and refused to be released so they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. The world wasn't worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains. They lived in caves and holes in the ground. This is a catalogue of disaster now he's writing about, isn't it? People who are tortured, flogged, chained up in prison, stoned, sawn in half, martyred, ill-treated, wandering around in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. And then he says this, these were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. I, I'm so glad Hebrews 11 is in our Bible. I'm so glad we have the fantastic, victorious stories of men and women who by faith saw God do incredible things. I'm so glad that's there because we live by faith and trust God. God works so often in amazing and dramatic ways, but I'm glad the whole chapter is there. And don't read the first half of the chapter only. That there are those 
who live by faith, who are commended for their faith, and yet they suffered, were flogged, were chained, were imprisoned, were stoned, were sawn in half, were destitute and persecuted and ill-treated and homeless. Sometimes we do think that living by faith will always lead to recognized success. No, that is not true to Scripture. That we will never be beaten and overcome, that is not true to Scripture. Jesus himself was called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. These are men and women here who died in faith. They died battered, bruised, and damaged. You see, this shield of faith doesn't mean that you'll never get sick and you'll never have a hard time and you'll never be let down and you'll never be hurt. No, it means that in the midst of that, it is true God may intervene in any one of those situations dramatically, but in the midst of that, your fortress, your hiding place, your shield is that you trust him. That you look beyond the physical, material, visible to the invisible presence and working of God. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. looking beyond and living with certainty in the midst of difficulties and hardships. And I don't know where some of us are this morning. I don't know what's been happening in your life in the last week or two weeks or last month. I don't know what the doctors told you recently. I don't know what somebody in your family may have done to you. I don't know what kind of things have gone on in your place of work. But there'll be many of us here this morning and there are things in our lives that hurt us and threaten us. But there's a hiding place, a refuge as our faith looks beyond that which is staring us in the face to a God who's unseen, who we can trust. The first martyr in the New Testament was Stephen, and Stephen is described as a man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. So he's a man full of faith, and when he died as a martyr, as they threw the stones that crushed his body, he looked up, it says, and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. Jesus normally seated on the right hand of the Father, but Stephen saw him standing. Some have said maybe standing to welcome the first martyr home. I don't know, but I've made this point here before. Although... Stephen, being crushed to death by those stones, saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. Jesus didn't do anything to prevent Stephen dying as those stones smashed his body and left him dead in a pool of his own blood. But Stephen was a man of faith. What does that mean? It means he looked beyond what was going on physically and materially. He saw the unseen God and trusted him. What he didn't know, and hindsight is a wonderful thing, and we know some things by hindsight we never know at the time. And we know there was a young man, too young to throw stones, who was looking after the clothes of those who did throw the stones, and no doubt cheering them on. He was a student in Jerusalem under a man called Gamaliel. His name was Saul of Tarsus. And years later, Saul of Tarsus was arrested on the Damascus Road by the Lord Jesus Christ and became the great Apostle Paul. Some years ago, I studied the preaching of Peter and the preaching of Paul in the New Testament, in the book of Acts in particular. About eight sermons of Peter, nine of Paul, and there's also a sermon by Stephen. And I discovered that Paul's preaching was remarkably similar to Stephen's preaching. Peter's was quite different. Stephen left his mark on Saul of Tarsus as he was dying. But he saw beyond it. The shield of faith means in the midst of the battle, I look beyond. God, you can rescue me out of this physically. And if you do, that's great. But whether you do or whether you don't is beside the point. You're doing something here. When I was a student in Glasgow, 
many years ago now, a room on the same floor that I was on, a couple of doors down in the residence where we were, was occupied by a guy who came to study for a few months from Cambodia. He'd been in the Cambodian army, his name was Chirik. And he'd become a Christian, and he had got out of Cambodia, this was the days of the Khmer Rouge, and the killing fields, and the dictatorship of Pol Pot, who was probably one of the worst, if not the worst, of all the 20th century evil dictators, and there were a number of them. And at the end of the course, he was only there for a short time, Chirik felt that he should go back to Cambodia. He said, I'm Cambodian, why? I need to be back in Cambodia. He left his wife and his son, little baby son, behind. He went back to Cambodia within a year. He was killed by the Khmer Rouge. There is a book I've been looking at just recently called Killing Fields, Living Fields, subtitled The Unfinished Story of the Cambodian Church, a church that would not die. And they've tried to reconstruct what happened to Chirac. What they know is that after he had been killed by the Khmer Rouge, the soldiers who killed him washed their boots and cleaned their boots in his blood. Left behind a widow and a son who would be fatherless. Before Chirik returned to Cambodia, we had a little service to commit him to God. I remember him saying, I don't know what lies in Cambodia for me. I only know that many of my contemporaries are dying, and I may have to die with them. But God is taking me back. Chirik died in the armored vehicle, the bulletproof vehicle of his faith in God, that although physically he died, he had a refuge and a hiding place. And the story is that right up to the end, he was telling people about Christ and how he could change their lives and died in the process of doing so. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We look beyond the material and the temporal and the visible, not to nothing, not to a make-believe, but we look beyond to a God who is eternal and secure and sure, and in that we live with a refuge, a shield of faith that trusts him, that looks for him, that looks beyond what is seen to that which is unseen and is certain of that which is unseen. The full context of that verse in segment 4 I just read is we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So he says, yes, outwardly we're wasting away. All kinds of things are going on. But these are light and momentary troubles. You're here today, gone tomorrow anyway. And there's something that is eternal that far outweighs all of this. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. What is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. The Bible doesn't promise us that all will be well, but it promises that we can be secure in Christ in the midst of difficulties. And this is the protection of the shield of faith in every circumstance. And all our lives are different. Some of you will have horrendous things in your life. Others you relatively much lighter things in your life. But we're all in a battle 
And whether it's light or heavy, to all of us, the battle becomes intense at times. But where do you go to find a refuge? Where, where's your shield? Where's your hiding place? Where's your armored vehicle? It's being secure in God himself. You see, the weapon of our warfare, that is the shield of faith, is not getting God to take us out of our difficulties. The weapon of our warfare is our shield of faith, is bringing God into our difficulties. That's quite different. Getting us out of them would be lovely, and sometimes he does. But bringing him in may be that the intensity and the battle and the temptations and the conflict remain intense. But in it, there is a settled security in God like Job that caused you to fall on your face and worship. Naked I came from mother's womb, naked I depart. The Lord gave, the Lord take away. But don't ask me where he is, I don't know. East, west, north, south. I don't know where he is, but he knows where I take. That's why I'm secure. He knows where I am. Sometimes we want to know more about God than he will tell us about himself. What you need to know is this. He knows everything about you. And your security is in the fact that his eye of love and ultimate protection and ultimate purpose is present in the battle and the conflict. And we raise that shield of faith. My refuge, my hiding place is my trust beyond what is seen to the unseen God who knows exactly what he's doing. And when the big story is told, we'll say thank you. Because he does all things well. Let's pray together. I don't know where you are personally today because we're all in different circumstances. Some of us need a fresh trust in God. Maybe some of us here this morning, we need to come to know him. We have never really opened our lives to him in any meaningful and deliberate sense whereby we say to him, God, please come and be the central part of my life so that I can know you and trust you and experience you. Christ died and rose again to make that possible. And if you've never received him, you can invite him to come into your life this morning. And if you have, you need to find that he is your shelter, your shield, your refuge, your hiding place. As we live behind this shield of faith, Lord, I pray for everyone here this morning. Pray for those who are in hard times. Maybe it's something everybody else can see because it's open, it's external. Maybe it's deep in their own hearts. Maybe the loneliness of their own hearts. Maybe fierce temptations and battles that go on deep inside that nobody else knows about. Lord, I pray that we'll find a shelter and a shield in you as we look to you and trust you. And thank you for the way in which you will give us that calm assurance that though we may feel, as Job did, even depressed, even suicidal, that underneath all of that is the unseen one who we trust. And I pray you bring encouragement into our lives this morning. Those of us who need it, you'll encourage us deeply. That you love us. That we can trust you. We don't walk alone. And although we don't know where you are, you know where we are. And you're bringing forth 
gold in our lives. Make this real for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 